Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. In this video, recorded on I think the second, maybe third, longest day of the year for the longest, the summer solstice of 2023, I'm going to talk about the sun and how it is discussed in our original Old Norse sources of Norse mythology, the Eddas. And we'll find that it's surprisingly kind of absent. I mean, it's not totally absent, but it is not a, a body of mythology that emphasizes uh, celestial bodies. It's just not that uh, nature-focused. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think people have gotten some misconceptions about this over the years, and of course about what's really there in the Eddas here in just a moment. watching this channel, I'm sure you know that I would sure appreciate that you would consider supporting it. If you enjoy this free content, uh, there's a lot of ways you can support the channel. You can support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Norse by Southwest. You get to participate in live interviews with experts and all kinds of arcane things, as well as uh, talking to me on a monthly Zoom call where I answer your old Norse questions, and uh, just generally being accessible to your questions. There's my books, which uh, you can find pretty much anywhere, but Boulder Bookstore has already signed copies. Uh, some of the paperbacks of the Poetic Edda that I signed in May also have a special additional signature. There may still be some of those. Uh, I'm on Cameo, cameo.com slash Norse by Southwest. Uh, I have a merch shop, all kinds of things you can do if you want to, or, or super thanks on YouTube. That's another new thing. All kinds of things you can do if you want to help support this channel. So thanks for considering it. All right, so there's not that much of the sun in the Eddas. Here's why I think people misunderstand this. I believe that we have sort of two cultural tracks in our mind. We have one for our native original culture. For most people in the English speaking or adjacent worlds, it's kind of similar now, right? In this sort of post-industrial uh, world that we live in. And then we have a second track this kind of like other culture, all right? And I think we always have a little bit of difficulty separating distinct other cultures from one another. This is a little bit like the way that you might have noticed if you have tried to learn more than two languages in addition to your native language. It's very likely that the third language you tried to learn has weird little places where it's influenced by your second language. It's because your brain has a native language track and a non-native language track and your strongest non-native language is going to sort of influence how you handle the, the less strong one. So for me, any other language that I try to speak, no matter how distant it is from a Scandinavian language, is going to have a lot of Scandinavian influence uh, in addition to English influence just because that's my, my dominant foreign language track. So where am I going with this? I think we do the same thing with second cultures. And in this semi-homogenous, modern, westernized world, I think that often the second culture that we encounter is a kind of half Tolkien, half Conan the Barbarian. Um, I'm gonna use this word just because it's what I think leaps to a lot of people's minds, even though, you know, it's, it's and, and it's all fictional but this sort of fictional barbarian, right? Fictional, uh, close to nature people. And I think that we tend to think that cultures other than our own are sort of close to that. And so we tend to look for nature stuff in other cultures. We tend to look for gods being, you know, avatars of natural forces, for myths being allegories for natural processes and things like that. In fact, Norse myths are dominantly a 
about personalities, right? Odin is mostly a personality. I know a lot about what it might be like to meet Odin. I don't necessarily know a complete category, a complete catalog of all of his powers, right? Same thing with Thor. And although the natural world is noticed in Norse myth, it's just not a central focus, and there's not these personified natural forces all over the place that I think people often think there are. Now, the notion that that's there is often encouraged by things like Dungeons and Dragons, where, you know, every god is called the god of this or god of that. Those god of titles don't apply very well in Norse myth. And we also have to remember the difference between our two main sources, the Eddas, right? The Poetic Edda is a lot of poems, at least plausibly actually handed down orally from a pre-Christian period. Whereas the Prose Edda by Snorri Sturluson is Snorri basically kind of rehashing those poems in addition to a few that we don't have in that collection and trying to kind of rationalize them and make one narrative out of them. Whereas those poems don't always agree. Now, most people who have encountered anything in the Eddas have probably encountered the Prose Edda. I recommend the translation by Anthony Falks, by the way. Um, but people have tended over the years to find the Prose Edda more approachable just because Snorri is trying to make it a more coherent narrative. Now, in the Prose Edda, what does Snorri say? He says, first of all, if you want to say that anybody is the god of the sun, Snorri says, Froer rather pur regni oxkini solar. Froer rules the rain and the sunshine, but, you know, he tries to kind of make everybody in charge of something, so uh, I'm going to take that with a grain of salt. Snorri also tells a real weird story that looks like he's trying to conflate an old tradition where the sun and the moon are persons, right? They have personalities and where they're objects. Most of the time in the poems of the Poetic Edda, which I'll come back to shortly, it seems like the sun and the moon are objects and not persons. Occasionally it kind of seems like it's hinted that they're persons, uh, but not very often. And we might think of the way that if you were trying to reconstruct what we think about the sun and the moon from our stories, you might get a pretty inconsistent idea, right? You would see some kid shows where the sun and the moon have faces, right? There's a man in the moon. Um, you would get a sense from our conversation that we think the sun and the moon go over us, that they're moving relative to us because we talk about the sun rising or the sun setting right now. Uh, whereas, you know, technically it's the earth revolving and, and orbiting. Um, so you would get some, some kind of inconsistent ideas. You know, do they think that it, it's heliocentric? Do they think that it's a geocentric universe? Do they think that the sun and the moon are people? Do they think that they're not? If you were just relying on our stories to reconstruct our beliefs, which is what the position we're in with the Eddas. But Snorri is trying to always kind of combine things. And so his weird conflations, he says someone named Mundilfari or Mundilfari, his name occurs in a couple different forms, had a daughter named Sol, that means son, and a son, S-O-N, named Moni, that means moon. Now, Sol, the, the son, the daughter, God, this is going to be tough because I need to talk about S-O-N and S-U-N. I'm going to use the Norse words Sol and Moni. Remember, those mean sun and moon. So Sol and Moni are named that because they are, uh, he says, as beautiful or more beautiful than the sun and the moon. In Norse myth and sagas, the thing you want to be more beautiful than, than, than is the sun. So um, the gods, Snorri says, were irritated that he was so presumptuous in naming his kids sun and moon. So they made Sol pull the sun's, or drive the chariot of the horses that pull the sun, and Moni drive the horses that pull the chariot of the moon. This seems kind of confusing. This means that there is an object, the sun, pulled by someone named Sol, the sun, and there's an object named the moon, Moni, pulled by someone named Moni. 
probably, again, this comes from him seeing some traditions where soul and moni are talked about like they're persons to some where they're not. He then paraphrases a lot of stuff from poems in the Poetic Edda. So let's look at what's there in the Poetic Edda. I'll give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost, and I'll come and dive into this a little bit. So the main source for sun and moon stuff in the Poetic Edda is the poem Vavthruthnismal, where Odin and Vavthruthnir, a Jotun or anti-god, giant, whatever you want to call these enemies of the gods, compete about who knows more. And mostly what they're talking about is the past and the future. So they also get a little bit into uh, some present tense stuff. Now in stanza 12, Odin, in response to a question from Vavthruthnir, says, Skin faxi hetir er in skira dragr dag um drot mogu. Hesta betster thicker han met hreid gotum, oelusur mon av mari. So there's a horse named Skin Foxy, shining mane. Foxy means mane of a horse. Think of shadow fax, right? Like shadow mane. So Skin Foxy is the name of a horse who draws the bright day over people. He seems to be the best of horses among people, Wraith Gotham just being a tribal name. The mane of that horse always shines. So here we've got this thing about the chariot of the sun being drawn by a horse. And uh, it seems like day and the sun are kind of being treated as the same thing here. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. In 23, Vavthruthnir says in response to one of Odin's questions, Mundil furi hetir, han ermona fadir, oxwo solar itsama, himin huerva, theusculu herian dag, oldum at ortali. So Mundil furi is the name of someone. He is the father of the moon, moni, and also of sun, soul. They must travel the sky every day for people to tell the time, date, or tall. This is a, uh, another instantiation of the sun and the moon actually looking like people. We have the mention of the name of the dad, Mundilfari or Mundilfari. It's clear your horse Nori is getting that. And uh, here they do look like they are like persons, right? But then notice in 25, off through near again, Dellinger Hetir, Hanvar Dachs Vader, and Not Var Norvi Borin. Nu och ni skopo nyt regen oldum at ortali. So Dellinger is the name of someone. He is, was the father of the day, Dagger, and Night Note was born to Nor. The new and, um, well, basically full and new moon. The, the, the useful god shaped this, the, the full and new moon for men to be able to tell the time and date. Here it doesn't look like day and sun are the same thing and Day has a different father. So even Vavthruth and Small being probably in an origins a compilation of wisdom, right? A compilation of sort of mythological trivia has what looks like semi-contradictory information, probably well before Snorri. And it's interesting that then later, in, in just a little bit later in 27, Vavthruth near mentions fathers for summer and winter, but we never see any indication that summer is a person or winter is a person either. So maybe these are just for the, the convenience of alliteration, for the poetry, right? We can talk about, um, you know, if we need to talk about the sun and we don't want to use an S to alliterate, we can talk about Mundilfara Dothir, right? Uh, and then we get an M or a D to alliterate. So we talk about Mundilfara's daughter instead of just sun. Note also the emphasis on the sun and the moon as impersonal time-telling devices here in Voth through Nismal. They're not beings participating in anything. I'll come back to this in a moment because there, there's an exception to this, but mostly being used to tell time. Now, there's a really interesting exchange toward the end of Voth through Nismal where we actually get a very personal looking sun. Odin concludes stanza 46 by asking, 
hwadan cymr sol o in sleta himen, tho er thessa hevir fenrir farit. From where does the sun come onto the smooth sky when Fenrir has killed this one? Notice, if you're used to the Big Book of Norse Myth, or, I don't know, Big YouTube Channel of Norse Myth, version of Norse Mythology, it's not Fenrir who swallows the sun, it's uh, one of his sons, mm -hmm. Hati, but, or Skull, I guess it's Skull that swallows the sun in uh, Gilva Ginning and Snorri's prose edda. But uh, here it's saying Fenrir, so, you know, a variant myth, or just using Fenrir to mean wolf, but I think it may well be just a variant myth. Vakthuthin responds in 47, Eina dotur ber olvrovl oder hana Fenrir fari. Su skal rida tho er regen doia moder brautir mar. So the elf red name for the sun, nice little kenning for sun, uh, rare kenning for the Portugueta, uh, will bear one daughter before Fenrir has killed her. She shall ride her mother's roads, the daughter, when the gods die. So this definitely looks personal, although I guess you could also talk about impersonal things this way a little bit. Hard to say exactly how an impersonal thing has a son or a daughter, but I guess you could sort of talk about how Oh, you know, the Rockies are the daughter of the mountain range that preceded them. Or, or a better example would be English as a daughter language of Middle English, right? We often talk in sort of genetic terms about things that aren't really biologically related that way. So I just don't see a whole lot here that makes me say, you know, one way or another that people in, say, light Viking Age Scandinavia thought the sun and moon are persons or they're not. I think that they didn't care that much they're not central characters in any myth and they're kind of bouncing back and forth between talking of them vaguely as persons and vaguely not as persons now where do they come from snorri and gilvaginning is pretty clear in saying that the lights that we see in heaven the tungle which means uh, heavenly bodies includes the sun the moon and the stars in modern Icelandic it just means moon but in old norse it means all of those things that they are created from sparks taken from the original fiery part of the protocosmos called Muspel or Muspel's Hammer. We don't get a whole lot about this in the Poetic Edda. Voluspal stanza five has a scene from very early in the creation where we read, Sol varp sunan sinni mona hendi ini higri um himen yo dir, or yolder, sol thatne visi huar hon sali oti. So the sun cast, presumably cast its rays from the south, companion of the moon, uh, to the right hand of the heavenly horses, or that's the Konigsberg reading, uh, one manuscript, the most important manuscript of the Poetic Edda, but this poem is also in Hauksberg where it says Yoder, which would mean the rim. So if this is him and Yoder, although Hauksberg just says Yoder, not him and Yoder, but if it were him and Yoder, that would be like the, the rims of heaven. I think either one kind of makes sense. If it, if it is the right hand of the uh, uh, heavenly horses, then that could mean uh, that it's going east to west, which makes sense for the path of the sun. But then the heavenly rim, you know, obviously makes sense as I look at this, you know, heavenly horizon over here. Um, the sun did not know where she had her halls, where she had, you know, her places, her, her starting and ending places. And then in Sansa 6, the gods appoint the times of day to allow time-telling. So again, that emphasis on time-telling. And by the way, notice that sol, the word for sun, alliterates with sunan from the south. The sun is said in Old Norse and Old English to shine from the south. It's a little bit alien to the way we usually talk about the sun. But in the USA, we mostly live a good bit south of England or Scandinavia from those northerly locations, the sun does, I mean, it is more south uh, of one than uh, it typically is in uh, places where Americans mostly are. Another thing, by the way, about that word, the sun, notice that uh, the sun, when treated as a person, is a daughter, right, is a woman. And uh, grammatically, soul, sun, 
is feminine. And moon, moni, is masculine. That is the reverse of the Latin or Romance language situation, right? You have Spanish el sol, la luna. I don't think that you should read too much into this. I don't think that it's possible to assign a gender to the Proto-Indo-European, or should I say post-Hittite Proto-Indo-European uh, root for sun. I think it's actually a heteroclitic root for those who are into the technicalities of linguistics. So that the soul variant is originally the uh, nominative form and the sun variant with the N at the end, that, like we have in English, is uh, originally the oblique form. Originally the same word, but it kind of gets separated and languages tend to choose one or the other. So Old Norse chooses the L form, just like Latin does, right? Old Norse soul, feminine, Latin soul, masculine, interestingly enough. English, sun, which in Old English, sunna is, is feminine. Um, th I think this is sort of a minority situation for gendered languages, for the sun to be feminine and the moon to be masculine. Uh, Hebrew has a feminine sun too. Shemesh is feminine in Hebrew. I think that the feminine sun actually makes a little bit of intuitive sense if you look at how they always talk about the sun as this beautiful thing, right? In the sagas and in the myths, they often really obsess about the beauty of women. And if the sun is regarded as sort of the prototypical fair, beautiful thing, then I think that makes some sense. Um, but there's never too much reason to try to assign, you know, whys to gender assignments of non-gendered things and languages with gender, because a lot of times it is super random. Uh, often in handbooks and websites, social media about Norse mythology, you'll see people talk about a sun goddess. Typically, they don't actually use the term soul. I found that they use the term sunna, which looks more like the Old English or the Old High German form of the uh, word for sun. It could also be because in Alvismal, a poem in the Poetic Edda where a dwarf gives alternate names for lots of things, he says of the sun, Sansa 16, Sol heter med monum, en sunna med godum, kalla dvergar dvalins leka, uglo jotnar, ol varfagrahuel, alskir osa sunir. So it's called the sun among men, soul among men, but sunna among the gods. The dwarves call it Dvalin's toy, the, Jot the Jotnar anti-gods call it the ever-glowing, the elves call it the fair wheel, and the sons of Asir, which are gods again, call it the all-shining, the all-bright. Um, he is just, this is really kind of like a poet's source book, right? He's giving you different things you can call different things in order to alliterate them with different words in your Old Norse poem. If you're interested in more about Old Norse poetry, I think the last video that I posted as of this point uh, gives you a breakdown of how to compose Norse poetry in English and features some of my own surprisingly explicit uh, examples uh, for someone fairer than the sun. Um, anyway, the fact that he says that it is called Sunna among the gods could be why you see all these you know, Norse myth influencers trying to say that there's a goddess Sunna, but I think it's probably giving them too much credit. I think they just are sort of attracted to the Old English, Old High German form of the name because it looks more like the English or German form of the name. More people speak English or German than Old Norse. Now, what happens to the sun at the end? We get a little bit about this in Grimnes Mol. So in Grimnes Mol, we read uh, in Sansa 39, the fate of the sun, Skol heitir ulvar er fulgir inuskir leita godi til varna vidar, and anar hati, han er hroth witness somar, so skal hyr heida brudi hemens. So Skol is the name of a wolf who follows the bright god, talking about the sun. God is neuter in Old Norse, it could be a god or a goddess. It's a goddess in the context of the sun if it's a person. Anyway, follows the sun to the protection of the wood. Notice, sounds like that, it's not composed in Iceland, seems more continental Scandinavia because there's not that many places in Iceland where you're, you've got a forest west of you. Um, but another one is named Hati, hate, 
He is the son of Hrothvitnir, famous monster. This is a poetic synonym for Fenrir. That one shall, in parentheses, I would say, run in front of the bright bride of heaven, which is obviously the sun again. That one is running in front of the bright bride of heaven, presumably because it's following the moon, which I guess precedes the sun, if you think of night as preceding day. Kind of a chicken and the egg problem. That's certainly how Snorri takes it when he paraphrases this in the prose edda. Volospol, in talking about Ragnarok, also has a little bit about the sun. Stanza 40, we have the famous line that goes either in uh, the Hauksbok wording, sport bear the soul scheme, the sunshine becomes black, or in the Konigsbok version, the sunshine was then black. Uh, we also read in Stanza 55, the Konigsbok version, soul tear sort not, the sun begins to, to blacken. That's at the very, very end of Ragnarok. Uh, Grimness Mall is a little bit more about some of the stuff around the sun that's kind of interesting. Stanza 37, Odin says, Or vakar ok alsvidr ther skulu up hedan svangir sol draga, en und thera bogum holu blid regen asir isarn kol. So Or vakar, early waker, and alsvidr, all wise, they must uh, draw, they, the uh, thin or hungry horses, must draw from here up the sun, and under their shoulders, this could mean withers in a horse context. I tend to think these probably means it's under their legs, though. Because I'm trying to think of where you would put bellows under a horse. Uh, the, the gods, the happy gods, hid under their legs uh, an iron cooler, which Snorri clarifies and says is a bellows. All right, makes sense, I guess. Something to keep the sun uh, from burning them or other stuff. And we also see a concern that the sun will burn other stuff in Sansa 38, where Odin says, Swol, just means cool, or Swalin, depends on which manuscript you read. In Konik's book, it's Swol, and AM 748, it's Swalin, the cool. So it's called cool or the cool. He, a shield, stands before the sun, before the shining god. God is. I know that hills and seas must burn if he falls away. So there's a special shield also that keeps the stuff below the sun from burning up. I don't know if that's based on observing something about the sun or if the idea is that the disk of the sun is maybe the shield and that the rays are kind of what's coming out around it. Hard to say as I don't think we have a picture of this. Other things to cover with the sun. Um, I'm super reluctant to see allegory anywhere. Um, I've never understood the point of allegory exactly. Mm -hmm. Like this story. So the two stories that I've often seen assigned as allegories about the sun are the death of Balder, because he's a bright shining god, right? Very beautiful. Sounds a lot like the sun um, who was killed. So maybe this is like winter. But remember, the sun is feminine, so Baldur seems like a bad stand-in for it. And uh, mostly the death of Baldur seems like this exact kind of family tragedy that you find in the sagas. I don't feel like it needs to be a nature allegory, nor do I feel like the god Freyr sending his servant Skirnir, plausibly has a name meaning something like the Shining One, to, uh, to court Gerther, whose name could mean something like farm, um, although all of this is reading way too much in the etymologies, it's just a common woman's name. Uh, you know, people see this as maybe like Freyr is nature sending the sun to wake up the farm in spring or something like that. Or it's a story about a guy who gets obsessed with a woman and um, doesn't want to see someone whose relative he killed in order to court her, so he sends some other guy to do it. Right? I mean, I am a big... I, I'm, I'm hugely in favor of just reading the contents of the ten and saying, well, I guess that's what's in the ten. I would rather teach the story than teach some obscure, bizarre uh, retelling of it. But then I hardly have the heart of a poet or whatever. As I said, the sun is strongly associated with beauty, so you will see it all over the place used uh, as the point of comparison, especially for beautiful women. Snorri says that the light elves are more beautiful than the sun. Uh, Volospa says Gimle, the hall where 
uh, the survivors of Ragnarok will live is uh, Favor than the Sun. Uh, surprisingly, there's also a negative. Sorter's sword shines like the sun, or brighter than the sun, according to Snorri. In uh, Fjol's Finsmall, Fjol's Sweet Dogger's Bride is Su and Sol Bjarta Bruther. She is the Sun Bright Bride, which is a little weird because his dad is also named Sun Bright, Sol Bjarta. Um, it's easy to find examples of, of the sun being the, the point of comparison for, for beauty. And then, of course, most of the time, any, any place the sun is mentioned, even in the Eddas, it's incidental, right? The sun is rising because it's morning. The sun is setting because it's night. The sun is good for you, right? Hovamal 68 has this uh, little nugget. Elder erbetzter met ita sonum ok solar sun. Helen disit ev mother hava nair on with lost at leva. Fire is best for men's sons, i.e. men. And the sight of the sun is also best. Uh, his health, if a man can get it, and to live without a flaw. So here, just being in the sun is considered good health, right? Uh, very incidental, hardly uh, mythical. Same way, you know, in, in Horbrasleo, that just went around searching for sun all over the Portugueta. You know, Odin mentions the, the rising sun just as a way to mark time. So what we see here, I think, is much like in our own culture and not that much like the sort of D, D barbarian culture that i think people often associate vikings to the sun is i mean important for life but kind of an afterthought because it's just there and you can't really do much about it they don't seem to have a cult around the sun there doesn't seem to be if, if there is a personal sun deity it's a goddess her name is apparently just soul sun and we know nothing about her, right? She, she might be the daughter of Mundilfari, Mundilfari. Apparently there's some tradition where she is, and apparently there's traditions where Sol, this woman who's the daughter of Mundilfari, is the one who pulls the sun. I'm sure that's just Snorri getting confused between the personal and the impersonal stories. Almost as if someone were writing a story about 2023 English-speaking culture and said that we believe the earth revolves around the sun, but the sun is a man, right? Like, it's just like they're confusing two different threads of our stories. Well, as the sun sets on this very long day, after months of long days for a different reason, um, I am thanking Patreon, thanking... Uh, my own sun bright one, should she listen to this. And uh, from beautiful Pikes Peak country, high up in beautiful Colorado, know that I am wishing you, from this summer solstice to the next and all the ones thereafter, uh, years that just keep on getting better and brighter for you. All the best.